What's happening, guys? Welcome to The Last Call. Carson here. We got a great one for you today. The entire half hour is going to Green Day, one of the biggest bands in the world. I talked to the guys. We've got great performances. In fact, they'll be performing all week long. More on that later. Tonight, I'm coming to you from Warner Brothers, which is the parent company to Reprise, who is the major label that put out Dookie. That's Green Day's first major label album released back in February of 1994. It was a bit controversial in the punk world, but it went on to do great for the band. It took them over three weeks to record that record. Billy Joel did the vocals in about two days, and it really set them off uh, to become the biggest band in the world that they are today. As I mentioned, we're gonna talk to the guys. They're gonna perform. But first, you might be asking yourselves, how did these three punks from Oakland go on to achieve so much success? It's a good question, and we thought finding out that answer would be fun. Green Day, in a way, made good on the promise of punk, you know, from long ago. They, they were guys who were inspired by the original punks and then overcame almost every obstacle to become one of, if not the great rock band of their time. Green Day formed in 1987 and made a name for themselves in the Gilman Street punk scene of Berkeley, California. Their 1992 album, Kerplunk, became a hit with the underground, and two years later they released their major label debut. Do you have the time? It was really weird. I remember when Dookie came out, and all of a sudden everybody was like, whoa, we forgot our love of bratty, three-chord fast punk rock songs. And it was just kind of like the right band at the right time. When we heard Dookie, the entire album through, just every song. Welcome to Paradise and Basket Case were my two songs that I just flipped Our out first over. band practice was Paul, our bass player, teaching me how to play when I come around. So that was yeah. Good Charlotte's first band practice. When I come around. And then they were everywhere. Magazine covers and everything, and that was like, it was such a cool thing for us because it was the first time we'd been exposed to loving a band and then seeing them get big. I think me and Bench both saw like opportunity. We were like, wow, this could happen. Dookie went on to sell over 15 million copies worldwide, and Green Day followed it up with three well-received punk rock albums that pleased their core fan base, but didn't penetrate the mainstream the way that Dookie did. When you achieve a really, really great success like that, there's always the pressure of like, well, geez, what do we do next? And I think the reaction on Insomniac was like, well, let's show them we can rock. Let's show them we can just hit it hard. So Nimrod, to me, was actually a very pivotal and, and record. It was very transitional because it was the place where the band really, just the first time they really branched out. And then, in September of 2004, they released American Idiot. Don't wanna be an American Idiot. There are few words scarier than rock opera, and one of them would be punk rock opera. When I heard punk rock opera, I uh, wanted to stick needles in my eyes. My first impression was, wow, the lyrics are incredible. The band has really gone to another level. Oh, they basically risked it all to take that mantle. After selling 12 million copies of American Idiot, embarking on a 15-month worldwide tour, and winning a Grammy for Best Rock Album, Green Day entered a rehearsal space in Oakland, California, to write the follow-up. We never really talked about it, but there was a lot of pressure doing the follow-up. They felt like American Idiot had set the bar and it opened up all these doors, and they wanted to continue doing that. Well, I think 21st Century Breakdown is sort of a reflection of everything that's happened. The sort of sense of despair met with a sense of optimism. Some would point to 22 years in the music business, three Grammy Awards, and album sales nearing 50 million copies as Green Day's legacy. Others look at their ability to connect with legions of fans around the globe and say that's the band's greatest achievement. The people love it when a great record comes and it, and it goes into their, into their life and their soul and they can digest it and go, oh my God, this record makes me feel awesome. That's what we want and that's what Green Day does. Thank God for Green Day. Well, there you have it, the Green Day story, and it is a good one. In fact, the guy stopped by at the Last Call Studios recently. I had a chance to sit down and talk to him and catch up. It's been a while. We talked about their new record and what those guys' lives have been like recently. Here's the first part of my interview with Green Day. Yes. 
Thank you. So good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> this is our first couch test. It is? Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for being here, guys. Congratulations. Uh, the record, 21st Century Breakdown. Uh, it comes out. It makes its debut here in the States at number one. It's number one in 13 countries its first week. It's, it's, it's uh, number one in more countries now. Uh, big congrats to you. And to Walmart, suck it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't need you. What was the deal with that? They wanted you to edit the record, or? Yeah, they wanted us to take all the, the bad words out. And it, <laughs> Wait, whoa, what the? <laughs> and, uh, that was not a joke. Uh, <laughs> And it, uh, it, I guess it didn't really fit into the Christian agenda, so. It's uh, crazy to me, it's crazy to me. You can go to Walmart, you can't get a Green Day record, but you can get a gun. Yeah, I know, I mean, we said. No problem. We, we well, said, guns are funner anyway, right? Yeah, right? Yeah. And yeah, we say you can put us in with the guns, I mean, that's fine. It's unbelievable. Let me, let me just start with this, because it's just so incredible that you guys are just, you know, at, at its core, you're a punk rock band from the Bay Area. 19 years of the three of you in this incarnation of Green Day, 22 years for two of you. Mm -hmm. Just sort of simply put, what is the glue that holds you guys together? Sperm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have no idea. We just keep going and um, I don't know. I feel like, you know, I, we were just close and, you know, we live in the Bay Area and that's always a plus. And um, we, live, we actually live close by to each other too. It's not like, um, you know, we live really far, like a distance away. So we see each other every day, and, or most every day. And, um, That's what we like to do. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah. Smu we smother each but other. But I watched that Metallica DVD and it just scared the crap out of me. It's like, scared a, the crap out of me, As too. a fan, <laughs> I had no idea that there was just that much, just, you know, almost there's hatred in a, in a group. And it's just like, you guys have been around now so long. It's just amazing. Yeah, it amazes me, too. I mean, it, it, I, mean I think about... So, things don't seem like a long time ago. Like, you know, like the first time that we played, like, the Weenie Roast or something in, like, 94 or something, you know I mean? Right. Or the first time we played Gilman, you know. You know, my son's band just played Gilman for the first time not too long ago. How so. was that? Um, it was pretty cool. It, they, they played <laughs> they the... Good? They're great. They're great. I'm not going to say what the name of their band is, though. Can't do it. Okay. Uh, but they, um, they played... The fir their first show was on the, the day that our album came out, on a... Friday, the, the But that doesn't blow your mind, Billy Joe, to be there on Gilman Street and look at your kid playing that stage, just being like, man. Well, I was in New York, so I had a, I missed it. Oh, no, how dare you? <laughs> he can make his own damn way. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you have it. That's just the first part of my conversation with Green Day. It's all Green Day tonight, so we're going to take a break. When we get back, you'll see more of our chat and also a song from Green Day's new record coming up on Last Call. Do you have the time to listen to me whine? What's happening, everybody? Welcome back to Last Call Tonight. It is the All Green Day episode. And right now, we're at Ocean Way Recordings on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood, California, one of the most famous recording places in the country. This place has recorded everybody from Bob Dylan to the Rolling Stones to the Mars Volta. And also, Green Day tracked both the American Idiot record and the new one, 21st Century Breakdown, right here. It's a good place. Anyway, let's get back to part two of my talk with Green Day. When American Idiot came out in 04, it ended up sort of paralleling what was going on in America, especially with George Bush's last term. When you started to write for Breakdown, in around 07, we had this campaign between this, this man who represented Hope and Obama and then McCain. How did, did that, did you watch that election as you were working creatively on this record and did that influence the writing? Yeah, I mean, watching it was kind of like watching Darth Vader against Luke Skywalker or something, <laughs> but, um, we started writing songs in January of 06, and it was just kind of photographs and, um, of, of everything that's happening. There's nothing in particular that you're, I sing about like within the lyrics. It's always, it's kind of, um, I don't know, a wash. I, I know sometimes I look at what I write about, what the hell is that about, you know? But it's, uh, you know, and it's anything from like a different crisis every week to, you know, um, and, and it could be a personal crisis, but it could be financial, it could be, um, uh, you know, losing your home, but w it all comes down to where it's everyone's in it together, and, and um, it's kind of it's all personal, really. So I mean, so then the idea of like trying to come up with like characters and stuff like that, you know, with uh, Gloria and Christian and how they're sort of a, a yin and yang to each other, and uh, one carries the torch and the other one is trying to burn everything down with the torch. So right. it's, you know, it's uh, you know, it's very intense. <laughs> Did you know after American Idiot that you wanted to do a record just sort of this big? Because I mean, you could have kind of run for the punk rock kills a little bit, gone to the studio, just did a hard, fast record, put it out. But 
at what point did you go, let's take this creativity that we have and let's, let's turn it up a notch? Well, you know, after American Idiot, I, I thought it was like, man, it's, you know, it's, we, we reached a new creative level for ourselves and it was like, you know, we need to keep moving forward, you know, I mean, and, you know, now that we have your attention, you know, it was like, let's just keep moving and, uh, you know, and just be even more creative than we have, we've ever been before. So, it was, right. you know, I taught myself how to play piano, started writing like that and, uh, you know, we just started, you know, mess, you know, making like arrangements more unpredictable than than they were before. There's, I mean, making a punk record. I mean, I think it is a punk record. You know, I mean, especially the fact that we do whatever the hell we want. You right. Know, so, how's it for the rhythm section with the addition of all of these arrangements and? Well, we love it. We love arranging songs and just tweaking structures and, you know, having just kind of, I don't know, it's been a, been a lot of fun. You know, like Billy said, you know, we reached a different level at that point. We kind of felt like we just literally, when we put out American Idiot, we felt like we just tapped into this new way of looking at songs and, and kind of writing, heading in a different direction. So it's, it's been nice. Right. Yeah, it's Your gig's fun. changed a little bit in 19 years. I just hit stuff. <laughs> <laughs> he does it for a longer period of time now. Yeah. Uh, um, Butch Vig was the producer on this record. And people, if they don't know, did Nevermind from Nirvana and Siamese Dream from the Pumpkins and Sonic Youth. He's got this great, rec this great repertoire of working mm -hmm. uh, on some great records. Um, we had Shirley Manson on the show, who was in Garbage with Butch and, and months ago, and I apologize. She sort of just, yeah. like your people came to us. She said uh, in the interview on this show, she said that, uh, that Butch was going to be on the Green Day new record before like anybody knew about it. And sorry you heard it that. here first. Um, you heard literally. it here first. How was, uh, how was Butch Vig, though? He tells great tales of working back in the day with Kurt Cobain and the guys. How was he in the studio? He was great. He, he brought sort of a sense of calm and focus and, um, you know, at the, yeah, yeah. at the time we were... We'd written so many songs, and you know, we we had kind of driven ourselves uh, crazy, as I think you probably should, you know. And he came in, and it was like, uh, you know, it's time to open a bottle of wine, boys. And you know, I'm, I'm give, doing a bad Wisconsin accent. Right now. <laughs> it's pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, but he's like, he was great. You know, he had, you know, I, we really respect everything he's done before because he's, there's never been a record that he's done that he hasn't been into. Right. You know, whether it's like a a punk rock record or a big rock record or, you know, uh, doing remixes for people and stuff like that. I mean, he, uh, you know, and he just, he likes good songs and, uh, yeah, we had a lot of respect did for you him, change? So. Did he change the way you guys actually record? I think that Butch kind of gave us a, a, he, the, the sonic quality of what, what we've done on 21st Century Breakdown is more bro wider and bigger than we've ever been before, you know, and um, you, so you can definitely hear butch in that and i think what's really important for for records is that you can hear the individual characters of the band members i mean i, I think that's what makes a great rock band it's like you listen to the who you know those members of the band you can hear roger right. daltrey and pete townsend you can hear keith moon mm -hmm. and john entwistle and i think with that with that butch kind of really brought that out you know you can really hear mike's playing and singing and and trey's playing and uh, masturbating in my um, lead singing. <laughs> and playing guitar. The tour kicks off July 3rd in Seattle. When you're at home, are you dying to get back out on the road? Yeah, I mean, that's where we kill it the hardest, you know? I mean, that's, I mean, we're a live band. We play, um, I, I like to pride ourselves as being like the best live band in the world. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know, and that's what you know what it comes down to for us is breaking down the barrier between us and the audience and putting on the best live show we possibly can. Even you know, it's cathartic. It makes you, uh, you know, it, you, you know, there's nothing left on stage. That's for sure. Um, all right, how's your golf game, Trey? Terrible. <laughs> Terrible. You play golf when you're on the road? No, not really. You don't bring your clubs? No. What's your handicap? <laughs> That's my leg. <laughs> Handy capable. I swear, nothing has changed. <laughs> nothing has changed. I'm stealing this, by the way. Go ahead. <laughs> Just do me a favor, take it out on tour. <laughs> me and my monkey. <laughs> and you wonder why you're not on the couch. <laughs> and you have a... <laughs> Thanks, for the yeah, thanks for being here all week. As always, great to see you guys. Safe travel. Thanks, Good to talk to you. All right, we're going to take a break. Green Day right there, chatting them up. They're going to strap on their guitars and play the number one rock song in the country when Last Call returns.
like our version of like Street Fighting Man or something by uh, Rolling Stone. So it was just a, uh, it was about just uh, it was an empowered moment about having a really positive message. Do you know the it's just some songs just hit you over the head like a two by four. It really kind of represents Green Day and the, the raw spark. All right, there's Green Day right there talking about Know Your Enemy, the first single off the new record. Welcome back to Last Call. It's all Green Day tonight. We're going to perform that song for you in just a little bit. As a matter of fact, you're going to get a lot of Green Day as they'll be back uh, as our musical guests both Wednesday and Thursday night. And for you Green Day fans, Foxborough Hot Tubs will be the music on Friday. I'm in the Pro Tools Mix recording room here at NBC. This is where all of our music comes through this room, and uh, that's fantastic. Let's get to Green Day right now. On the last call stage, performing Know Your Enemy from their new album, 21st Century Breakdown. Roll Green Day, fellas. <laughs> Awesome, that was Green Day right there. Know Your Enemy from this album, their brand new one. It's their eighth studio record. It's called 21st Century Breakdown, and it's all Green Day all night. We're not done. We'll wrap up the show right after this. 
Another turning point, a fork stuck in the... And that's going to do it for the Green Day Show. Obviously, thanks to Green Day. We appreciate it. They'll be back tomorrow night as the music. Also, Thursday night and Foxborough Hot Tubs will be the music right here on Last Call on Friday. On a personal note, I want to dedicate tonight's Green Day Show to a very close friend of the Last Call family who we tragically lost last week. His name was Max. Max was the biggest Green Day fan uh, that we knew, and he was a great guy. Uh, Max, you'll be sorely missed around here. That's our show, everybody. Good night.